Hello everybody, Scott Golden here with the Hell in a Cell review for October uh, 25th, 2020. Man, wow. Um, the fact that they feel the need to do Hell in a Cell yearly, the fact that they are completely inept at the concept of building even network purviews where people are paying $10 a month for them versus pay-per-views where people used to pay 50 60 70 well i don't know if they ever get to 70 but 50 dollars or more for them and the fact they can't do it anymore is just really really sad to me um while there's nothing terribly i wouldn't necessarily say super offensive on this program it is a reminder very clearly that they don't know how to build towards something people want to see. And when I can honestly say, and, and the, the impact review will be up this weekend or tonight as well, when I can honestly say that impact put on a better show, even with all the challenges they had, including talent not appearing, that says a lot about where WWE is as a brand. Anyway, um, pre-show, they do our truth and Drew Gulak. Uh, five and a little more than five and a quarter minutes. Uh, Matt starts with stupid comedy. Um, Gulak pretends to high five little Jimmy before kicking him. Truth attacks. Truth does does the John Cena comeback because well, Truth is a John Cena fan, and he eventually wins with a jack knife cover. Akira Tozawa and Lucha House Party chase Truth around post-match. Gulak goes for uh, um, he, he goes to the announcers to say John Cena sucks since that's the hero of Truth. Uh, Mustafa Ali cuts a backstage promo, basically says Retribution is behind him and uh puts out a challenge to the Hurt Business, one of Retribution against one of theirs tonight, and it's up to MVP to to uh, decide. So the U.S. Championship or Intercontinental Championship or any championship really is so important in WWE that about, um, you know, less than, let's say, 15 minutes before we go on the air with one of the 12 biggest shows of the year, we just throw a title match together. Awesome. Anyway, we go to the main show. Uh, they do about 15 minutes of hype with a video package. Um, you know, for Jey Uso and Roman Reigns. So let's get this straight. Roman Reigns, the biggest guy on SmackDown, is so worthy of being considered a champion and the tribal chief and the face of the brand that he gets to be in the first match of a pay-per-view, network purview, with his cousin in a Hell in a Cell match. Are you kidding me? Like, on what planet do we go, I know, let's put a dangerous match out first so that everybody who's watching is is excited. I know, how about we take the guy we built for five plus years and we put him in there with his cousin because we haven't built up anyone else on SmackDown for him to challenge. I didn't, please go ahead, but a wall. Anyway, uh... So, Reigns wears a gold glove on his uh, right hand. Don't know what that's about. Shoulder blocks early. Um, and Reigns is dominant uh, throughout clotheslines. Jay comes back with some dives into the side of the cell during the early stages of the match. So, we can obviously see that the match isn't going to have any psychology. Uh, Jay manages to swear. Um... They, they missed the mark with this, so there's adult language on this program that's supposed to be targeted to children. Uh, Reigns spears his cousin, and then they go to the outside. Jay catches him with a drop kick, and uh, Reigns catches him with a right hand and hits a second spear. So now a mid-card talent, and no offense to Jey Uso, but that's how he's been portrayed for the last several years, 
has taken two spears from Reigns in the first, let's call it 10, 12 minutes of the match, and that's, that's acceptable. Anyway, so uh, Reigns tries a third spear. Uh, Uso hits a super kick, then some splashes. Refs check on Reigns. Reigns doesn't quit. Jay grabs a leather strap. Uh, Heyman begs on the outside, one of the better parts of the match, for him not to use it. Uh, Jay whips Reigns with it. Reigns actually gets up after the th- third shot and speared Jay for a third time. So now Jay Uso, a mid-card guy, can take three spears and get up. Wasn't it years ago that, like, Brock Lesnar took, like, five? So we don't even have the psychology to understand that Killing a guy's move is just not necessary. Anyway, uh, Jay says he can't breathe, but he refuses to quit. Reigns repeats, repeatedly whips Jay with the strap. Reigns ties the strap to his arm, whips him again. I mean, the strapping piece was, was pretty intense. I will give them credit for that being enjoyable because it shows intensity. Uh, Jay comes back with a super kick. And then basically tries to hang Reigns. Uh, looks like Reigns is about to pass out. Uh, Reigns passes out a second time. Ref checks on him. Uh, Jay uh, asks if he quit. Referee, referee says no. Jay grabs a chair. Reigns nails him with a Superman punch. So we use weapons. We use straps. We use choke outs. And yet. Reigns is still alive in the match. Reigns ap- applies a guillotine. Jay passes out. Heyman begs Jay to quit. How can a guy who's passed out quit anyway? Uh, Jay was out. Reigns let go of the hold. And the ref told Jay uh, all he had to do was say the words. Jay didn't acknowledge. So if there had been... Now, here's an interesting question. Let's suppose there'd been a real-life injury. Unfortunately, for pro wrestling, there's been a lot of those across several brands lately. How would we have known that with a non-responsive guy that that was a storyline versus not? I mean, I'm not saying that we have to, um, you know, be sanitized professional wrestling. What I'm saying, though, is when you when you beat a guy down to the point being being per- portrayed as barely conscious in a match where the verbal submission is necessary and he doesn't acknowledge, you get a really great area. Anyway, ref is about to call the match, but the ref, uh, the Roman beats up the ref for that. Uh, second ref runs down, manages to open the cage to get in. Uh... So then we see Adam Pierce, Jamie Noble, and a few others run down to, to stop Roman Reigns. Reigns closes the cell door and uh, throws the steel steps into the ring, which caused all the officials who are supposed to care about Jay Uso to run away. Uh, Reigns taunted, taunted, yeah, taunted Jay uh, and then lifts him up on the steps. Jimmy comes down, jumps in the ring. To protect Jay, Reigns drops the steps. Jimmy asks Reigns what's wrong with him and said they can work through it. Reigns became emotional, drops to his knees, which, I mean, the acting here was decent. Jimmy thought he got through to Reigns, and then he's putting in a guillotine choke. Jay tried to help before eventually saying, I quit, to save Jimmy. Reigns wins the match. Funky finish, stupid finish, poor writing, but I think they'd book themselves into a corner, and I don't think they could have produced a satisfying satisfying finish to this unless they'd actually given us the, the one hope spot of Jay winning, even for a week, even if he just win, He does the Luger and Hogan thing from 97, where he wins, and then on the next TV, he loses it back. I mean, they could have done that anyway. Uh, Reigns is greeted by Afa and Sika, who are both over 70, by the way, who probably shouldn't be, oh, I don't know, in a COVID hotspot. But they congratulate him, embrace him, and pose with the title. And the Usos look on. Uh, Elias defeats Jeff Hardy in just under eight minutes. 
Alliance does a quick performance about Hardy being a drunk. Gee, we're back to this storyline. Tremendous. Hardy had sets up for Swanton. Elias rolls to the outside. Hardy's on top of the ring post. And uh, he grabs a guitar away from Elias and smashed him with it in the back of the head for the DQ. This was horrible. Complete throwaway match that was not needed. Otis does an interview with Caleb Braxton. He's angry at The Miz, basically. The whole idea of that is he's angry because Miz is trying to steal his briefcase and stole his girl away and sent her to another brand. Um, so there's um, sponsor ads behind the announcers somewhere here. Miz and Miz with John Morrison against o- defeated Otis with Tucker. Uh, for the Money in the Bank contract, 727. So, we go back to WrestleMania. Remember WrestleMania? When the pandemic, uh, about, what, I don't know, six months ago, and we, and then we moved to Money in the Bank five months ago or whatever. And Otis wins the Money in the Bank. And we had no plan the whole time. Because if this is the plan the whole time, then they're just brain dead. Um... Yeah. So th- they hype that this is the second match ever where a man could lose the Money in the Bank contract. Uh, he didn't mention that the first match is Edge beating Mr. Kennedy. Morrison is about to hit Otis with the briefcase. Ref saw him and tossed him out. Miz is distracted. Otis uses schoolboy for near fall. Otis hits a discus clothesline for near fall. Uh, Tucker nails him with the briefcase. Tucker nails Otis with the briefcase uh, at about six and a half minutes. And uh, Miz is amazed by this. Miz covers Otis, gets the win. Miz is the new Money in the Bank holder. He celebrates with the briefcase. Braxton catches up with the Miz and Morrison backstage. They're obviously elated. Uh, Braxton said that he won this at the expense of a friendship. Miz doesn't care about friendship, and Miz cares about the importance of the briefcase. He says he will cash in again. Tucker shows up. Braxton asks why he betrayed his friend. Um, Tucker basically says he carried the team the whole time, but he did all, and he did all the work. He treated Otis like a brother, but he felt like he didn't matter in the team and said it's all about Otis getting the spotlight, getting the girl, and getting everything else. But Otis couldn't function without him. So actually, I mean, haven't we all have had the friend that we've covered for who really didn't deserve it? Doesn't that kind of make Tucker the baby face in this situation, at least to some degree? Or at least split it down the middle to where there are going to be people that are going to be sympathetic to Tucker? I could imagine that in, in current day society. I don't think that's what they're going for. Otis uh, ran in, runs over Miz and Morrison, uh, briefly gets his hands on his former partner. Um The angle for this is pretty good. I have no interest in seeing Tucker versus versus Otis. I don't think either one is good in the ring. I know a lot of people do. I don't see it. I see them both as bigger guys who aren't really athletic, but they're not imposing because they're not big enough to be like giants. So it's not for me. Anyway, um, Sasha Banks defeats Bayley to win the SmackDown Women's Championship. In 26 and a half minutes, Bailey brings a chair with her to the ring, tries to use it, and Banks kicks it out of her hands. It falls outside the cell. This uh, upsets Bailey, even though she has access to other weapons around and under the ring. Uh, Bailey brings in the kendo stick. Banks tries to use it. They set up a table. Uh... Banks uses a dive into the side of the cage. That seems popular this evening. Banks hits a Meteora into the cell and a diving Meteora into the ring for two. Meteora is a good move, but it's overused by this point, especially by Banks, but also on the indie scene. 
they fight back and forth. Banks drop kicks Bailey into the steel steps. Banks uh, grabs the kendo sticks and uh, drop to hold, sending Banks into the kendo stick. Bailey uses a catapult into the sticks. And then slides her into the ring for near fall. Bailey makes fun of Banks, uh, calling her the boss in the cell. This is this is just stupid. I mean, I I like I love the matter of fact the Bailey and Sasha thing is one of the few things that keeps me watching. But the blow off here is too soon. They should have held this off. And we'll get to the finish of the match in a minute, but I don't agree with where they're going. Anyway, Banks gives her a sunset flip powerbomb into the side of the cell. Ouch. Uh, for near fall. Should have been a finish, but wasn't. Uh, Banks tries a cross race using his chair. Bailey drops her face first on the chair. Banks follows up with a running sunset flip powerbomb into the chair and manages to go between the ropes for a near fall. Uh... Bailey hits a flying elbow drop for near fall, and uh, several kendo shots by Bailey as well. Bailey grabs duct tape, attempted to tape two kendo, kendo sticks together. Don't know why. Um, let's see. So, uh, I mean, they wasted a lot of time here. And then they do the fire extinguisher spot, which has, hasn't been good since 30 years ago. Bailey wants to leave the cell. Referee won't let her. Banks attacks and drives her into the cell before using another running knee into the cell. That's like the fourth one. Banks repeatedly hits uh, Bailey with a kendo stick in the ring. Banks hits a frog splash, uh, but there's a chair between them. So they were both hurt, which doesn't exactly make sense. Bailey Sam's banks onto the black match, which leads to a two count. Bailey grabs a ladder and suspended it on top of two chairs. Why are we building like we're playing Legos here, ladies? Uh, she slams banks on it and spray painted an X on her. We don't know why. Perhaps they're going to impact and joining the X division. Um... Uh, Banks moves out of the way using a double knee strike in the corner and uh, followed by a Bailey to Belly on the ladder. Ouch. Near fall for Bailey. Bailey comes back uh, with a Bailey to Belly again. And Bailey tries another suplex. Banks counters this into the cross face with a chair wrapped around Bailey's head. Again, ouch. Bailey taps out. Banks wins the championship. Um was a good match uh but i it was too long for one and it i mean where do you go do you go back to a singles match do you go we're going to do a IWA Japan Mid South Explosives match like after you've done Hell in a Cell where do you go for Bailey and Banks i mean if it were me i would do hair versus hair at WrestleMania and embarrass the heck out of Bailey, but I would have had Banks chase the whole time and and do something, you know, really kind of cool with it, but they didn't. Anyway, uh, backstage, Charlie Caruso and MVP are there, and um, Bobby Bobby Lashley is the one to is the one to compete. Uh, Sheldon Benjamin suggested a guy with a tiny funny mask, Cedric Alexander. Uh, Benjamin clarified he meant Slapjack, uh, and MVP said he should be, um, one-on-one -on -one with no corner man. Lashley offered to put the U.S. title on the line. So this is a complete afterthought. We're in the middle of a show, and the champion goes, yeah, I'll throw the belt in just for, <laughs> why? Anyway, Bobby Lashley defeats Slapjack in, uh, just under four minutes to retain the U.S. championship. Slapjack gets some offense, but Lashley retains with a hurt lock. Uh, T-Bar and Mace immediately attack Lashley post-match. Ali directed, and Lashley fought back. Uh, gets Ali alone in the ring with the rest of the hurt business down. 
Ollie bailed Retribution included Mia Yim. We don't know why, because there's no women for her to fight. Um, and then, um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sad. Uh, so we get another Hell in a Cell match. Yes, this is our main event. Talk about a show that's, that's drawn out to be long just for the sake of being long. They go 30 and a half minutes. Randy Orton is your new WWF champion or WWE champion. So he's a 14 time champ now. Let me get this straight. A guy who's been around the company, including developmental, for 20 years is on the top of one of your brands. Stupid. Just stupid. Anyway, um, McIntyre comes out first for some reason. Uh, This is obviously an angle. Orton comes out in black pants and a hoodie. Sneak attacks during the entrance. And they brawl around ringside. McIntyre tosses him in. McIntyre's in control during the early part of the match. And um, they introduce the use of a chair. Uh, McIntyre tries to throw the steps at Orton. Orton Orton dodges the steps. Uh, McIntyre then sets up for the Claymore kick. Orton moves out of the way. And hits him in the leg with a chair. And goes right after the jaw. Orton takes over, pounding on the jaw, targeting the jaw for several minutes. Orton cuts uh, cuts off a comeback with a thumb to the eye. I will say Orton's a really good heel. He's good with pacing. There's no reason for this match to be 30 minutes. Except we're moronic and we think that every pay-per-view has to go at least 2 hours and 30 minutes. Um... And then they trade strikes in the ring, and Orton gets the better of it and uses a backbreaker. They trade strikes again, and then um, McIntyre hits overhead suplexes and a neckbreaker. Orton fights back on the outside, but McIntyre suplex him through a table that was sitting against the, the, the cell. They then hit the This Is Awesome chant, which, dude, there's no people... Why bring attention to the fact that there's no people? Anyway, McIntyre is going back in the ring. Orton kicks the ropes into the groin and uses a draping DDT for just a one count. Way to kill a finish. Orton grabs the belt. The bolt cutters and Byron Saxton uh, is surprised by this. They cut the cage door open. McIntyre goes up after. They both go up on top of the cage. Orton looks around and decides... that climbing the top of the cage is a good idea. Uh, Orton has a plan. He grabs a lead pipe, which is on top of the cage. Gee, how'd that get there? Uh, (laughs) McIntyre ducks the strike and fights back. McIntyre uh, allows Orton to hit him low with the pipe. Um, That's not good for his adult activity life. Uh, Orton began climbing down the cell. So they go all the way up there for lead pipe. Uh, McIntyre follows. Um, McIntyre falls off the side of the cage and crashes through the announce table. We assume, because the announce, the cameras didn't catch it, that he was trying an offensive maneuver. We can't really tell what he was doing. Um, you know, it looks like McIntyre jumped to his own demise, so they don't show replays of this. McIntyre's bleeding from the mouth after this. Uh, They eventually make their way back into the ring. McIntyre does a good bit of selling. Orton went for the RKO. McIntyre counters and hits a Claymore kick. Orton fell off uh, or out of the ring. McIntyre pushed him back into the ring. McIntyre goes for a second Claymore. Orton ducks, hit the RKO, gets a pinfall is the new champion. Um, So, again, a guy who's been around for 20 years, why is he your champion? Oh, yeah, either because, A, we're going to do him him and Edge at WrestleMania in their third match, 
which I'm sorry, we don't need to be at WrestleMania 37 with Edge versus Orton, or B, there's a thought that because Cena isn't around, Orton's the next best thing, and therefore we have to have him on Raw. The fact of the matter is, and this is what WWE doesn't understand, the only people that are still watching are your longtime fans who are kind of, kind of have Stockholm Syndrome with WWE, and they'll watch no matter what you give them. Other than that, there's nothing they've done in the last year, maybe even two years, that that's drawn new fans. I mean, McIntyre winning might have done it if if um, there was a chance that oh I don't know he he might have uh, had decent opponents to fight, but they didn't give us that anyway. That's your Hell in a Cell review. Not a good show. Not worth paying ten dollars to see. Anyway, keep your feet on the ground, your mind in the moment.